Good afternoon. Welcome to the Forum Press Center. And I'd like to welcome those who are in New York City who are joining us as well. Uh, today, we have the pleasure to have with us a special representative to the Muslim communities, Mr. Sharik Zafar. Uh, he'll be joining with us to speak on a number of issues that uh, we've been discussing here uh, in the news in the United States, uh, as well as the important work that he does. Uh, Mr. Zafar was appointed by Secretary Kerry in 2014, and we warmly welcome him to the Forum Press Center. Thank you. So good afternoon, and thanks so much for coming out today. Uh, it's a beautiful day outside, so uh, I, I do appreciate it. And I also appreciate the fact uh, that this is an opportunity for me to engage and answer some of your questions. Uh, I thought I could just quickly start off and give you just a quick overview of my work, and then I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have. So uh, as she said, I'm the special representative to Muslim communities. Uh, I, was, um, I was appointed. Um, I'm an appointee of President Obama, uh, sworn in by Secretary of State John Kerry last year. And my job is to drive Se Secretary Kerry and the Department of State's engagement with Muslim communities around the world of issues, on, of, issues of mutual interest and support of shared goals. Now, there's approximately 1.6 billion Muslims in the world, all over the world. And by and large, they care about the same issues that everybody else does. A growing economy, jobs, a clean environment, climate, peace and security. And so their concerns are American concerns. My job is to travel to parts of the world, like Muslim-majority countries, like Indonesia, Malaysia, but also engage Muslim-minority communities in Europe and look for ways that we can work together. Um, the, the areas I focus on explicitly are promoting entrepreneurship. I mean, many parts of the Muslim world, average populations are uh, under 30 years old. And so they need jobs. And by and large, these aren't going to be government jobs or even large corporate jobs. We're going to need to encourage small and medium enterprise. So entrepreneurship is incredibly important. I, I also focus on the creative economy. So for example, uh, the film industry, the television industry. The reason that we do that is because there's jobs in these industries, but also it's incredibly important, I believe, to give Muslims a voice, not only to tell their own stories, but also to push back against negative narratives. For example, there are narratives right now that Muslims in Europe can't be full European citizens. I reject that. I think Muslims can be, uh, can, can be uh, you know, absolutely proud and integrated members of European society. But there are extremists and other groups who say no, and you can't be. There's a narrative right now that says that, you know, that uh, Muslim women in particular shouldn't, shouldn't work. They shouldn't, they shouldn't have the equal opportunity in education elsewhere. We reject that. That's why we make, a, make it a point that whenever we have entrepreneurship programs that we include women. It's the sad truth, there's lots of bad stories out there. And so part of my job is to not only push back and share positive stories, but also build the capacity of Muslim communities, especially young people, to share their own voices. And so we do that through entrepreneurship programs, but also programs involving media, training, capacity building. The last issue I focus on uh, is a, it, which will come as no surprise, and, and these are just three. There's, you know, sadly, there's no shortage of work, but it's the challenge of violent extremism. Right now, violent extremists are targeting Muslim communities for recruitment and radicalization. And I say targeting because just like sexual predators target young people, that's what these people do. Online and social media, they're looking for p young people who are vulnerable. Oftentimes, parents have no idea what's out there. So part of what we need to do, and part of what we like to do is A, inform parents and religious leaders who oftentimes aren't aware about the very sophisticated attempts to recruit and radicalize, particularly when they're using new, new media and social media. But also what we're trying to do is to help them push back. Now, as an American government official, what I, ha what I have to say about Islam or religious beliefs, despite the fact that in my personal capacity I'm Muslim, I don't have a lot of credibility. I'm not a religious scholar. I'm not an alim, right? There are religious leaders, community members, parents, others, civil society who are committed in, to taking on this ideological fight. And they have a story to tell. Our job is not to tell their story for them, because, you know, but our jo job is to help them tell their own story. And so to me, governments in many respects, when it comes to challenging ideologies, have, need to take a back seat and really make sure that we help those people who have the most credibility, who frankly feel the impact of extremism and terrorism more than anybody else, help them tell their own stories. So those are some of the areas that I'm working on. Um, I understand some, some of you have some questions, so I'm happy to ask any questions, and, and, and maybe you can, you can sort of moderate and make sure that we, everybody gets a chance. I'd like to do, 
I'd like to do something a little different. I'd like to first go to New York because I see that there is someone here who has a question for you. So New York, please. Um, hi there. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thanks so much for the briefing today. Um, uh, I've got a question, I guess, about sort of like comparative policies and politics that are taking place in, for example, Germany. Oh, I'm and, sorry. I beg your pardon for interrupting. Uh, uh, can you tell us and your And the U.S. Name? at the moment. Oh. Um, if you take a group like Islamic, Islamic State, which is in your field of work as um, uh, countering violent extremism, they look at a country like Germany, which is taking in a large number of refugees from Syria and other parts of the Muslim world. And that's a very difficult narrative for them to counter because you've got uh, large numbers of Muslims that are fleeing the kind of lifestyle that they're offering and going to Europe with its, you know, um, uh, you know, decadence and kafirism. And I'm just wondering uh, what you think about what's been happening in the U.S. recently, where there have been like strong moves to stop President Obama's efforts to accommodate 10,000 Syrian refugees. And also there's talk at a very high level, um, your presidential candidates talking about barring Muslims from coming into the country. Does that play into a group like Islamic State who um, are able to, you know, point to these things that are taking place in the political discourse of this country and say, yes, look, that's what the West is like. It's anti-Muslim. Well, first of all, as, as an American diplomat, uh, my job is to advance American foreign policy interests. And so my focus is overseas. So it's not appropriate for me to comment on domestic politics. Also, let me just say that. Nevertheless, hey, no. The question, the no, question I, I was actually a question about overseas, and it was about the way that um, uh, that uh, that the U.S. Uh, it was a comparative question about how the U.S. and Germany appears to the violent extremist right. groups that your job is to counter. So it was a specifically foreign question. I mean, right? No, no, I understand. Let me let me let me answer your question. I understand. So. Well, the first point I'd say is that the United States has made a commitment to taking in refugees. You know, President Obama, Secretary of State have stated that very clearly. And it's really, I really can't improve upon the words that they've said, that we have a commitment to taking in refugees. And that refugees, out of all the categories of people who come to the United States for settlement, have received the, st most, the, st the most stringent, stringent testing, A. B, President Obama said it very clearly uh, last, uh, last Sunday, that bigotry, and sadly bigotry exists everywhere, but bigotry and these types of anti-Muslim statements that you find advance, advance uh, the ISIS cause because they propagate this view uh, uh, that n there is in the United States is, uh, is, is uh, against Islam and Muslims. Now, that's simply not true. That's simply not the American government's policy. It never has been and never will be. President Obama has said over and over again, Muslims are part of the fabric of America. He said that when it comes to Islam in the United States, there is no us or them. It's just us. But you're right. When you have these types of, when you have these types of statements, those, are, those uh, terrorist groups, there's no doubt these terrorist groups try to take, capitalize on these types of statements because they, try, they, feed, they feed their narrative. That's why it's so important for government officials, but as well as civil society leaders and religious leaders to push back. Now, oftentimes what you hear, you hear some of the negative rhetoric, right? And that's what gets the headlines, and I understand that. But that's not the whole story, right? So you had a thousand rabbis in the United States sign a letter in support of admitting Muslim refugees in the United States from Syria. You just recently had a Catholic charity uh, r uh, receive money from a Jewish synagogue in the state of Indiana to settle a Muslim refugee family from Syria. So you had a, you know, a, a Jewish group supporting a Christian group in support of Muslims, right? So that, to me, is the story of America. And, so in, in the cha my challenge is to make sure that these types of stories, which frankly are very ordinary, but they're very consistent and they happen all the time, make sure that this narrative comes out. Because you're right that uh, there are groups and extremists, when they, when they hear hateful and bigoted rhetoric, it does, it does feed their narrative. And we have, to be, we have to be very clear that doesn't fully represent or is not an accurate representation of America. What's a representative of America, frankly, is a seven-year-old boy in Texas who took the entire savings of his piggy bank and gave it to a mosque that, that, had, that, had, uh, uh, that was vandalized. That is the story of America that needs to get out. And that's why it's important. I'm glad that I had this opportunity today because it's important that we say that, look, there's a larger story. And what you, what you see in the headlines is not the full picture. Yeah, that's a question from here. Yes, ma'am. Hi, I'm Alicia Rose from NHK. Uh, I was hoping that you could speak a little bit more about the State Department efforts to counter extremism and also radicalization. I know there's some efforts over social media also uh, reaching out into uh, Muslim communities and also possibly to mosques. So, wow. Um, 
the State Department takes its, its role very seriously, and when it talks about countering terrorism, countering extremism, uh, you know, step one is we have, you know, we have to support our partners, you know, whether, you know, in, in, in Iraq, in Syria, uh, around the world, uh, the Arab states, other Muslim-majority countries, and frankly, you know, our European NATO allies, making sure we're supporting them and closely coordinating with them. And in areas like cutting funding, making sure that f extremists aren't able to travel, uh, making sure that uh, people have the military support and that we're closely coordinated. The area I focus on, and which I think needs you know, to rec continue to receive a great deal of attention, is actually pushing back against that narrative. Yeah, pushing back against violent extremist ideologies, and that's why you know we've we, and the president made it very clear on Sunday. He said, you know, what, uh, Muslim Americans are part, and the United States is 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 uh, the United States is partnering with Muslim countries and with Muslims. Uh, Muslim soldiers are fighting and dying against uh, uh, fighting and dying in, in, in our military efforts against these these extremists, but that we all need to do more, including Muslim. Communities need to do more to push back. It's not enough to denounce the violence that we have to undermine and push back against these ideologies. Now, how do you do that? Well, it's difficult because oftentimes governments lack credibility, right? And these extremists, they oftentimes speak in a language that young people understand. So a traditional religious cleric or an imam will give a very good sermon, but it won't be in a language that young people who are attention spans are shrinking will pay attention to necessarily. Now, the bad guys, terrorist groups, etc., they realize this. That's why they use short form of videos. They use social media. They speak in a language that young people understand, leveraging platforms that young people use. So one of the our challenge is recognizing our limited credibility, but recognizing, frankly, a great capacity to build others' ability to speak is looking for ways to appropriately impact and improve civil society, others' ability to push back. But making it clear that our job is not to actually come up with the arguments, because we, a, a, you know, in many respects we're limited because of divisions of church and state, but also because we, we don't have the credibility. And increasingly, I think what we we're recognizing is taking a partnership approach where our job is to build the capacity, but really putting civil society, religious leaders, et cetera, in the front is going to be the most effective. Thank you. Um, this is Jahazeb Ali uh, from Airway News TV, Pakistan. I have many questions, but uh, this is a press conference, so I'll ask one. I hope after this press conference, you will talk with me <laughs> exclusively. <laughs> we'll say, yeah. um, after the California incident, uh, the Pakistani community have some concerns uh, living in America. But my question is that, that after this incident, are you going uh, to put some st more strict conditions for the Pakistanis to get the visas? Because this is already very difficult for the general public in Pakistan to get the American visa. So are uh, you going to uh, take some more strict measures for the visa, especially for the fiancé's visa? Thank well, you. So um, as, some, as, a, as a proud Pakistani-American, someone who's born in Karachi, um, I know firsthand that the Pakistani-American community has denounced what's happened, is shocked and dismayed uh, about the tragedy that's happened in San Bernardino where so many uh, lives were taken senselessly. And they have spoken out, and they have made it clear that this does not represent them, just like American Muslims have spoken out, this does not represent them. And, and in fact, over $200,000 have been raised by the American Muslim community. There's a, there's a program called Launch Good. It's a crowdfunding uh, 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 platform. It's actually created by an American Muslim. And they've raised to date over $200,000 by American Muslims in support of the victims of San Bernardino. This is another example of American Muslims, Pakistan America's others, uh, you know, an accurate portrayal about you know, their, their commitment to their fellow citizens. So they made it clear this does not represent them and that they're hurting and they are mourning just like all Americans are. Uh, I understand your question. Look. We always have to be clear and careful that whenever we admit that you know, we meet people in the United States, that we have, you know, the president and the secretary, one of their chief obligations is to make sure the American people are safe and secure. And so we, met, we, we always have stringent guidelines about who can come in under what circumstances for how long. I'm not in a position to talk about any new policies uh, or, or, or measures, but what I can tell you is the United States remains open for business, it remains open for tourism, it remains open for education. We are an open society. We will continue to be an open society, and that includes visitors from around the world, including, including in Pakistan. Now, there are certain procedures different people have to take, 
and certain forms that people have to fill. And it's important that people you know, uh, follow these forms uh, and, and follow, obey the, the, the appropriate protocols. But the United States is open for business. Hi. Mohammed Atif, Voice of America. You see, the best thing about America is that whoever gets the citizenship calls himself an American, mm -hmm. and that's been, thankfully, a, a big thing, big difference when we compare America to Europe. Part of the problem in Europe is a European would stay a European, an immigrant would stay an immigrant, whether he's a Muslim, he or she's a Muslim, or uh, follow some other religion. Are we engaging with our European partners to teach them how to, you know, change this narrative and accept the immigrants as their own people. So, as someone, frankly, who's an immigrant, you know, uh, who was born overseas, uh, the best decision my father made, besides marrying my mother, was to move here. You know, I'm, uh, I, uh, uh, I thank him every day for this because, you know, this, yeah, I'm, I'm a very proud American, um, and uh, I feel like you just said, I feel, you know. When, when my wife became an American, she was just as American, entitled to full rights as anybody else. It didn't matter that she became an American as an adult. And that's, you know, we are a nation of immigrants, and immigrants contribute incredibly to American life. If you look at some statistics, for example, in Silicon Valley, the number of startups that were created by immigrants from countries like India and China, uh, but who are now American, is something like 30 or 40 percent, right? So immigrants contribute to American life every day in every state. And we're a richer country. The United States has every religion, nationality, tribe, ethnicity, faith as part of our citizenry. And that's a national asset. We are strengthened by this diversity. The, the seal of the United States says, e pluribus unum, out of many one. And this diversity, this is a real strength for us. The innovation that you see in Silicon Valley and other parts of the world, in Texas, in Florida, in New York, and other parts of the country, excuse me, that is a direct result of our ability to track some of the world's best and brightest minds, but also to give people a chance, an opportunity, and that includes refugees. So we are very grateful to be a, a nation of immigrants, but when it, the question of integration is a two-way street. It's, it's certainly important for immigrants to integrate, uh, to learn the language, uh, to become familiar, to fully participate, to vote, to organize, to obey the law, like all Americans have to. Right? But it's important for governments also to make sure that people have equal access to education, to labor markets. Uh, so it's a two-way street, right? Now, no country is perfect. We can all do a better job. Uh, the United States certainly is committed you know, to taking in immigrants and making sure that immigrants have the, school and the, util and the sk skills and the tools to integrate. And that's something we do because we, we know it's good for the United States. We work, we're, in close co uh, we're in close coordination on these issues with many of our partners, including in Europe. Uh, I have to say, I've, you know, as part of my job uh, as special representative, I engage European Muslim communities, and I've engaged young French Muslims who believe they are French, and they are French, and British Muslims who feel they're British and Muslim. And uh, there is no, there is no uh, controversy or paradox that you can be both. And so part of this is a false story that you have to choose whether you're European or Muslim, and I reject that. And I know there's many, many European countries uh, whose policy is exactly the same. So it's not for us to, frankly, teach other countries. Uh, you know, rather, it's, a, it's a, for all of us, all these countries who believe important the importance uh, of making sure that immigrants are integrated and welcomed appropriately uh, to work together. And I think this is a shared challenge and that, we, that I look forward to continuing to work with our European allies on. Thank you, Bing Yu Wang with Hong Kong Phoenix TV. Um, I wonder if you have re any reaction to the fact that after Mr. Trump's ban Muslim comment, his approval rating within the Republican voters actually has increased. And also, do you agree that right now the fear of another terrorist a attack inside the United States has outweighed the um, respect to freedom of religion? Thank you. Well, again, you know, I work for the Department of State, uh, I'm, uh, so I'm at a foreign ministry. It's not for me to uh, certainly to talk about domestic politics. Uh, it's not appropriate. We have, you know, we have a division of labor in the United States government and the Department of State. You know, our focus is overseas. Now, we're of course mindful of you know, of domestic realities. Part of our job is to tell America's story, right? And I really can't, uh, you know, improve on the words of the president when, you know on, on Sunday night when he said that you know hateful rhetoric 
Discrimination has no place in America. And I have to say, you know, as, as a point of President Obama, this is our national policy, and, and Secretary of State has reiterated it as well. But this goes back. Shortly after 9-11, President Bush made it clear. You know, he went to a mosque and he said, you know, those people who feel that they can terrorize Muslims uh, or in who can, uh, you know, I I I I respond in violence, don't respect, don't respect, I think the exact words was don't represent the United States, they represent the worst of humanity. And so this is a consistent policy of the United States government that transcends administrations and it's going to continue, all right, period, full stop. Now, the question of fear is an understandable one, of course Americans are scared, just like people across the world are scared. More Muslims are killed by terrorists than anybody else. Groups, the victims of terror of these groups, like Daesh, ISIL, um, Al Qaeda, others, are more Muslims than anybody else. Shia, Sunni, what have you, parents, young people, they kill indiscriminately. And certainly in the United States, we're no stranger to terrorism, as we just saw in San Bernardino. And so it's understandable for people to respond, you know, to be people to be fearful. So it's important that we're vigilant, that we work, that our law enforcement and our intelligence organizations work in close coordination and cooperation with communities. But we shouldn't change our way of life because that's what the terrorists want. They want us to change the way of life. And that's why it's important for us not only to be strong, to act strongly and use all appropriate legal means to prevent terrorist attacks from occurring, and that's incredibly important, and for communities and governments to work very closely together. But it's equally important that we be resilient. This is not an existential threat to the United States. The United States is strong. Our allies, the United States, and many parts of the Muslim world, we're strong. This is not an existential threat. Sadly, there is going to be, you know, there is violence. And there will sadly be continued violence. But it's, it's, it's very important, certainly from, as an American, that we be resilient. And we make it clear that these types of acts, however painful, however much damage is inflicted, how many, however sad that lives are lost, it's not going to change the American way of life. And we're going to remain to be, we remain an open society. Yes, sir. Uh, thank you. Ali Imran from Pakistan Today newspaper. Uh, you touched on a very important uh, dimension in your initial remarks, which was the question of narrative. Mm. Uh, can you tell us, uh, from on the basis of your interaction and experience with the leaders of Muslim world, uh, what is the State Department doing to counter the ISIL ISIS narrative? Because this has been one of the reasons, you know, young people from various parts of the world are being drawn into that militant organization. Thank you. So, with respect to narrative. It's important that we have a division of labor and that we understand th that governments have a role, religious leaders and communities have a role, civil society has a role, the international community, the media has a role. I mean, this is a shared responsibility. Now, we believe very strongly in this Department of State that the best way to respond to some of the negative narratives is with facts, frankly. You know, some of these groups like to, like to pretend that they're actually, you know, that they're advancing and they're winning well, when they're not. They like to say that they're actually have the ability to govern, and they use some you know, more pro social media propaganda to say, that, oh, you know, we're actually a functioning state. We have the ability to govern when they do not. When there is no food, there is no water, uh, sanitation does not exist. Right? So we are, the governments are best placed, frankly, to respond with facts, and we do, and we're going to continue to do that. To, when myths are created, we, we, you know, to address these myths. Um, and that, that, I think, is a very appropriate role for government. When it comes to religious arguments or the stories of victims of terrorism or the stories of parents, mothers who've lost sons, uh, when, it's, when it comes to uh, den denouncing the actual ideology, whether it's masked in religion or elsewhere, we're not always best placed. And so well, our job is really one of building capacity. And so I said this earlier. What we're doing is looking for ways to build the capacity of non-government and voices to tell their own story. Because ultimately, they are m victims more than anybody else, Muslims, but they also have credibility. And we have to be mindful of that. We have to proceed with some humility. When it comes to law enforcement action, intelligence sharing, military actions, making sure that funding is cut off, all these roles, that's where government has to lead. And we are leading We're together with our partners, including many, many Muslim-majority countries who are part of the anti-ISIL coalition. But when it comes to pushing back against the narrative, we do have a role 
but it's a much more modest role, and it's, it's, it's really important that Muslim communities, others, uh, step up. And Ms. Bo, you had a question. Oh, I'm sorry. I Uh, uh, creating conditions to give an economic ho economic hope to the people, especially those who are marginalized communities and who are uh, vulnerable to exploitation. Is that part of the so uh, narrative? When it comes to economic development, that's just part of our American foreign policy. That has been for decades. My colleagues at the U.S. Uh, Agency for International Development, USAID, every day they work to look for ways to support uh, entrepreneurs and economic development in many parts of the world, and that includes Muslim Muslim countries, Muslim majority countries. That's just good government. That's just good foreign policy. That's the generosity of the American people, and we do that, frankly, because we want the rest of the world to develop economically. We want them to buy our goods. We want to buy. We want them to buy their goods. That's why the president, you know, one of his lead, uh, his chief priorities right now is getting this Trans-Pacific Partnership trade deal. Uh, finalized because it's, you know, increased trade means in increased economic opportunity. So that's just good government. That's just American foreign policy, period, full stop. I don't think you can always say that ec lack of economic opportunity is the root cause of terrorism. I think that's too simplistic. I think people that arguments made. No, there's no question it's a factor, right? It is a factor. But I want to be very clear that the reason that we promote economic development is because we care about these countries and these communities, period, full stop. Now, it is important, though, that young people, including young Muslims, have economic opportunity. Because if they don't, there is the possibility that those people who can offer jobs or money, things like that, uh, you know, may be able to convince people to go down a bad path. There's no question about that. Uh, but that's not the only reason that somebody would be radicalized. If you look at radicalization, we're dealing with a social phenomenon. So this is social science. This is not hard science. Right? And so there's a, it's, you know, the, the path to radicalization is not necessarily a linear progression. There can be a lot of different factors. Economics can be one. You know, religion, theology can be one. Politics can be one. Uh, you know, psychological issues, right? That said, I, you know, one thing that I take very seriously is the idea of promoting entrepreneurship because it's so important that young people have opportunities. You know, we're dealing with a youth bulge in many of these countries. And we have to make sure that this is not a demographic bond bomb, but a demographic dividend. And part of that is giving young people the skills they need to develop their own businesses and to grow, to grow their own, own local economies. Okay. I have one question here. Yes, sir. And then we'll go to New York. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Tatsuya Mizumoto from Gigi Press, uh, which is Japanese wire service. Mm. Um, so my question is, um, so uh, what? What can you expect uh, to Muslim community and then religious leader in order to push back mm -hmm. extremes? I mean, uh, what uh, can you explain the concrete step um, which the community and leader can do? Sure. Take? Th I mean, uh, like, like uh, uh, there are a bunch of you know uh, th the information. Mm -hmm. um, by ISO, they're going to use uh, social media. So do you think the community and then the religious leader mm -hmm. should use social media also and then to counter, you know, narrative by ISO? Yeah. Or do you have any idea? I think there's three areas that not just religious leaders but parents, community leaders, people of goodwill. There are three, I think there's three basic steps that, uh, that, need, to be t that need to be taken. The first one is to be informed. Oftentimes, religious leaders, parents, others have no idea the number, uh, the, the range of extremist propaganda that's, that's available very easily to young people. And so it's really important to know what's, what's out there and that what young people have access to. So at, at a very basic stage is to be informed. Just like you would want to know if young people are accessing pornography or other types of illicit content that, you know, you would want to know if young people have access to extremist, violent extremist propaganda. So the first step is to be informed. Know what's out there. The second thing is to, you know, engage with young people and others and make it clear, you know, make it clear that these views are unacceptable, that they don't represent religion, in this case Islam, you know, and to, to have these open conversations, you know. Look, people have questions about foreign policy. P young people have questions. They want, you know, they, and, and it's important that, that religious leaders and parents be able to engage them and speak with them on these things because, you know, they're going to go looking for answers, right? And if they can't get the answers at home, or from a religious leader, or from a friend, or from somebody. They'll, they'll go look the answers elsewhere. 
The last, the, but the last area, so the first one is being informed. The second one is to pr protect and engage them. But the third area, what we really need are those people who are best placed to actually push back and undermine the propaganda. Is That's the area, I think, for the greatest action. right? And whether it's putting forth victims' narratives, sharing the stories of parents, making religious or theological arguments, using humor or satire. I mean, right now, I think there's a range of areas where people can, you know, where people can actually push back and counter the narratives. So that, to me, I think that's the area that we, you know, we need to see more. I'd like to go with uh, one follow-on, yes, and then we'll go to mm -hmm. New York. So actually, um, the problem we have now is, you know, the parents cannot cannot know, you know, their kids mm -hmm. is going to be um, uh, radicalized, and then the people sound. You know, such a person don't know, cannot know. So how we can identify, you know, the person is going to be influenced by, you know, ISIL narrative. So that that is an issue. So well, I mean, ultimately, you know, parents need to know what their children are up to. I mean, at, at some stage. I mean, the you know, governments. There's a role for governments, for law enforcement, for the intelligence services. The role for at the education sector, other sectors. Absolutely. But parents need to know. You need to know what your young people have access to. I mean, religious leaders need to know this. They, they, they need to be mindful of this. Just, I refuse to believe, if you look at other social ills, or, uh, you know, or, or social is perhaps not the best word, but other problems that communities are facing, whether it is the threat of g uh, gang violence or sexual predators or, frankly, you know, uh, uh, other types of ills, we, we fully expect parents to be involved and to know these types of things. Well, this is the same thing. Look, it's the Muslim communities are not the problem. Muslim communities are not the problem. Muslim communities, by and large, in the United States and overseas around the world, are like everybody else. The challenge is they're being targeted, right? So it's not that we're not blaming them. They have nothing. You know, we, we shouldn't blame them because they haven't done anything wrong. The challenge is they're being targeted. These groups, these terrorist groups, are looking for ways to get their propaganda and to target young people. And so parents need need to be aware of this. Religious leaders have to be. They, they, there's, I mean, it's not the it's not ideal, but it's the truth. You know. Well, thank you. Back to New York. Thank you for waiting. Over to you. Um, yes. Hi there. Thanks very much for giving uh, me James Ryan from Middle East. I a second uh, question. Um, it's uh, another question that sort of bridges uh, um, domestic issues with your broader mandate uh, through the State Department and to Muslim majority countries. But it's about this. Uh, new rules that are, were voted on in the House this week about changes to the visa waiver scheme mm -hmm. that's going to impact mostly Europeans who are also dual nationals or have got links with Muslim-majority countries, four of them, Sudan, Iran, Iraq, and Syria. I presume you know the background to the changes, changes that the administration has come out in support of. But my question is, why is the administration supporting uh, policy change that's going to hit people because of who they are rather than what they've done? Well, first of all, the visa waiver program, uh, we continue to support the visa waiver program. It represents a partnership that we have with some of our closest allies uh, where because of, because, of, uh, because of the security situation, people are able to come over without needing a visa. And that's we, we remain very much committed to that. But with all security procedures, you have to take into account recent events, and you have to take, in account, and take into account the security of the American public. So I'm not going to prejudge the actual rules and regulations. I think that the, you know uh, 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 my counterparts have spoken for themselves. We'll see the impact. I'm not going to be. I really am not in a position to say anything more than that. But I would say very, you know, very generally that we remain committed to a visa waiver process. Now, uh, this, you know, in terms of the specifics and changes like that, I really can't get into that. Uh, I'm really not the best person. I, I'd encourage, you know. I think that's, that's, that question is really more properly directed to the Department of Homeland Security and others of the State Department because that's, that, you know, that's not an area I focus on. But at, at, at a very broad level, we remain very, very committed to the visa waiver program because it symbolizes uh, a, 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 ver a, ver a partnership with some of our closest allies. Thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you very much. I'm Ifti Harusin. I work for Voice of America, pastor to the Border Region Service, Pakistan, Afghanistan border area. Thanks for the briefing. Uh, you said you deal with the foreign policy, not the domestic issues. Um, generally, foreign policies are the reflection of the domestic politics and everything that happens, and that's why we believe pluralistic America. The people should know about it. You know, when President Obama last week was delivering the, uh, one of the uh, important speech, 
Uh, in, the, in the aftermath of the California shooting, he reached out to the Muslim world, uh, calling on them to be partners, and they must do. Mm -hmm. um, even then, there was nothing new. The question is here, that it is uh, not a routine in uh, general circumstances in which America uh, should reach out to people and the people should know uh, the pluralistic nature of America. Uh, in the California aftermath, in the Trump remarks, they're resonating across the Muslim world and they're becoming the identity. What is new, what is special, or something new is being done on your part and the State Department? Well, again, hateful rhetoric and bigotry exists in every corner of the world. You know, you've, you've seen, you, know, you, you see anti-Semitism, you see anti-Christian sentiment, anti-Muslim sentiment anti-Hindu sentiment. Sadly, that's part of the human condition. And I've traveled around the world uh, as part of this job. And I, you know, I've, and just as it's important that I, you know, that I address the rights of Muslim, Muslim, min Muslim minority in places where there are non-Muslim majorities, it's equally important that for me to address the rights of minority communities in Muslim majority countries, whether it's Christians or Hindus, etc. Right? So, frankly, this type of discrimination exists all over the world, and it's, that's why the United States government as a country that values religious freedom, where Muslims and Christians and Jews and Sikhs and Jains and others and Buddhists every day have the freedom to worship freely and to practice religion, because it's because we so value it at home in the United States that we make it a part of our foreign policy. We ha our Congress has mandated that every year we have to issue a report on religious freedom. We have my colleagues, we have an ambassador at large for religious freedom who tackles bigotry and religious intolerance. We have a specific, specific envoy to deal with the, the issue of uh, minority communities in South Asia and in the Middle East. So this is the policy of the United States government. This is, this is not just rhetoric. This is the actual policy of the United States government is to combat bigotry and hatred and intolerance. Now, you do see in the United States we're not immune to this. You know, you've seen bigoted actions against all communities, but that's not does not represent the United States. That does not represent. Uh, that's not the full picture of the United States. What I would say, what I said earlier, the more accurate representation are people. You know, are is the Jewish community and the Christian community and Republicans and conservatives and liberals and Democrats, people of all stripes from across the political spectrum, making their voices heard and saying standing in solidarity with American Muslims who are their fellow citizens. That's the, that's, that's, that's the reality of America. Now, it's understandable that what grabs the international headlines so oftentimes are hateful, are hateful activities, and, that, and, that, and that's certainly true in the United States. And that's why it's so important that we have opportunities like this where I have a chance to engage members of the media, prof media professionals from around the world, where I have an opportunity to do my small part to say that, look, the story of America it, are those great examples that I shared earlier, the Jewish groups, the Christian groups, non-Muslims standing up in support of, their, of, 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 of the, their fellow citizens, American Muslims. But it's a challenge, and I need your help. Frankly, I'll be very honest with you. I need your help because the negative narrative and narratives oftentimes grab the headlines. And even though they're not representative of the United States, they are, they are uh, oftentimes what people pay attention to. Look, if you look at the phenomenon of anti anti-Muslim sentiment, anti-Muslim bigotry, and you look at the phenomenon of anti-Americanism. People, you know, many parts of the world, you know, people have very negative views of the United States. Now, if someone has met an American, if you have an American business partner, if you travel the United States, similarly, if people in the United States and elsewhere have met a Muslim, have a Muslim neighbor, and their views tend to be much more positive, Right? But oftentimes, people who've never met an American or have never met a Muslim, you know, all I will actually have very negative views. So part part of part of the problem, uh, I think, part of the solution to the problem is for us to continue to, to actually not just you know sit uh, to actually look for ways that we can actually improve people, you know, the, the ability of people to actually come and learn about each other. That's why it's really important that you know Americans travel and meet Muslims, and it's really important for Muslims and others to come to the United States to see what we're about, right? Um, but I have to say, yeah, it, it is a challenge. I take your point. It is a challenge, and that's why I, you know, when opportunities like this come up, I, you know, I take advantage of them because I think this is this plays an important role in pushing back against some of the negative, negative narratives. Thank you. Do we have any other questions? Yes, sir. Oh, we have a microphone here. Thank you. My name is Martin Rizincheck with the Czech Television. I have one question. I know you said that the visa waiver program is not your 
Yeah, uh, a cup so of tea, I but I'll, I'll ask one question. Uh, there's a lot of Czech NGOs and humanitarian groups working in Jordan, uh, which is not part of the of the group, but Syria and, and Iraq doing their best there, helping the same communities that you deal with as well. Um, they're not going to be eligible for a visa favor just because of what they've been doing in, in these countries, because of they traveled to Iraq, they traveled to Syria, and they spent some, had spent some time in there. I, are there any estimates being done at the uh, State Department in the light of how much this screening of them, because they have to go through the regular, uh, regular uh, visa procedure, will delay, for example, their uh, applications or anything like that? Because I assume it will be well, it'll be a huge backlog of, of so, these So, I mean, I can't get into the specifics uh, because, again, this is not my, my area of expertise. But I, what I can tell you is our broad policy, you know, we are committed to a visa waiver program. And there is a balance between making sure that we're open and for, for business and for ex trade and for exchanges and things like that, that we're open, but also that we make sure that we're mindful and that we do everything we can to protect the American people and keep out the people who shouldn't be here, right? And it's a balance. And with, you know, new information – New security situations, things like that. You know, you, you, there are times when you have to adjust policies. Now, I'm not, I'm not uh, an expert on you know, in which direction this policy is going. I know there's been discussions about that, but you can be assured that my colleagues, the people who work on these issues every day, are very mindful of the situation. That just because you travel to a certain part of the world, if you're doing, you know, if you're delivering aid or doing some things like that, that should not impact. And now, how you do that? Look, you know, the sadly, government. Oftentimes, policies can't go down to that individual level. They necessarily have to operate at a macro level. And so that, you know, that oftentimes people are impacted. But you can be assured that you know, my colleagues, the ones that are working on those issues, are very mindful and are doing their level best to make sure that American security is maximized, but that we're also a very, very open society and welcoming society, including for our partners from countries that are part of the Visa Waiver Program. So, all right. Thank you so much, everybody. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you again. That concludes our briefing for the day.